Hello world, and welcome to our webinar on how to build React and Java web apps faster with Hilla. I'm your host, Marcus, and with me, I have Anton, who is the product manager of Hilla. Hello, Anton. Hello. How are things going? Well, uh, sadly, the winter is no more here in Finland, but <laughs> all the snow has melted. But we have a nice evening anyway. Yeah. No, it's uh, I'm I'm joining from California. It's seven o'clock at morning here, so I'm I'm still gonna be drinking my morning coffee here as we go through this. But welcome everyone. Uh, glad to see so many of you joining our webinar today. We're gonna talk about how to build uh, React and Java web apps faster with Hilla, and we're gonna look at Hilla itself, how that works. Anton's gonna go through a little bit of what we've been building just recently. We're gonna spend most of the presentation just in code and in the ID showing how how this new feature works and taking any questions that you might have. So just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, there we go. So we will have all the lines muted during the webinar, but you can ask questions during the webinar using the questions panel uh, in the lower right hand screen. So be sure to ask the questions there and we'll try to either pick them up during the talk whenever it's kind of a convenient uh, place for them, or then we'll save most of them for the end and we can have a discussion about them there. If there happen to be questions that we can't answer right away, we'll try to get back to you uh, later on. All right. And lastly, we will send you a link to the slides and the recording within about 24 hours of, of this ending. So if you are entirely new to VOD and you just happen to see a uh, tweet saying that there's a webinar about building uh, web apps with React this Spring Boot, and you thought you'd come and see, I'll just give a quick introduction to Vaadin. So we are a company that helps others uh, build and modernize Java-based web apps. And we have two different frameworks that help you do that. So we have Vaadin Flow, which allows you to build web apps fully in Java. And we have Hilla, which is what we're going to talk about today, where we combine a TypeScript front end with a Java backend with type safe communication between the two of them. All right. So before we get to the actual content, uh, we want to run a couple of polls just to kind of get a feel for who we have on the call and understand uh, who we're talking with. So uh, you will see some of the polls coming up now in your, in your uh, window there. So which of the following languages do you know? So are you familiar with Java, Kotlin, TypeScript, JavaScript, HTML, CSS? Also, which of the backend technologies do you use? So Spring Boot or Spring, uh, let's see, where did I, that go? Uh, Spring Boot, Spring, Jakarta E, Quarkus, Micronaut, Node. And then we have the final question here is, uh, which of the front end technologies do you use? Uh, oh, really curious about those. Yeah, I'm. I'm a little new to the the tool that we're using, so I'm trying to figure out where I actually see the answers coming in here. So we'll figure it out. So yeah, we're the last one was about front end technologies: Vaadin, Flow, Hilla, React, Angular, Vue, and Lit. And let me see if I can get these visible. So, all right, there we go. That makes a whole lot more sense. So if we start with just looking at the languages people are, are using, uh, we see that we have about 24% of folks here are using Java or, or say that they're familiar with Java, 21 HTML, CSS, very close by, and, and JavaScript, then kind of in falling order, TypeScript and Kotlin with 12 and 4%. Uh, so this seems to be trying to make sure, like understand how these percentages work here, but oh, let's see, 85, yeah. The percentages don't work. <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll have to share the, the results here, but let's say the majority of people here are, are Java developers who also know front-end technology. So that's good, you're, you're in the right place. We're, we're gonna talk about these things in a while. Uh, the vast majority of people are using Spring Boot, which is also good because we're gonna be talking about Spring Boot today. Uh, with over half of 
you online today using Spring Boot. Uh, up close is Jakarta EE with about 23%, and then we have node usage around 20%. Quarkus and Micronaut just getting a couple of percent each. And then if we look at what front-end technologies y'all are using, we can see that Von Flow is, out of everyone here, the most popular framework, just probably because we are on the Vaden channel right now with about 36% of you. And then we have React and Angular uh, up next. So we have React with 28% and Angular with 14%. So we have both Vaden flow users and we have front end developers here. And we have also a small percentage of already uh, people already using Hilla. So that's very nice to see as well. Cool. Let's jump on over to the next slide and just give you a quick introduction to what Hilla is. So if you are new to Hilla and you haven't heard of it before uh, this webinar, Hilla is a full stack framework for building web apps on Spring Boot. So what it gives you is TypeScript generation, which allows you to get full stack type safety between your backend and your front end. It also bundles UI components into the package so that you have kind of all the tools that you need when you're building an application in one package. You get zero config uh, build tooling, meaning that when you start the application, it'll start your front end dev server, your back end dev server. Whenever you change code in either, it's going to automatically reload and give you just that really nice uh, development experience that we're going to see in a, in a few minutes here. We support. Uh, we support both React and Lit on the front end, so you have a choice there. Today, we're going to be talking about the new React support that we just recently added. But if you're more kind of into Lit, uh, that is something that we support equally. Uh, Hilla is something that's uh, a framework that's optimized for developer productivity. So we're really trying to help you as developers stay productive and be able to kind of build meaningful applications quickly. The name comes from a berry that grows up in the northern parts of Finland and, and the Nordics in general. Uh, it's a cloud berry, and it kind of looks the way uh, you can see here on the left, and that's where the logo is coming from. Vaden is a Finnish company, and the other framework that we have, Vaden Flow, is a Finnish word for a reindeer. So it's kind of coming from that same area. All right, so we had a whole lot of Odd and Flow users here. And if you are not familiar with uh, Hilla from before, or you're just kind of curious and joining to see what, what it's all about, uh, I wanted to just quickly review what the differences are between the two. So uh, with Hilla and Flow, you're writing the back end in Java. But where the difference comes in is how you build the front end. So with Hilla, you're building the front end using front end technology, so TypeScript, HTML, and CSS. Whereas with Flow, you're building the UI in Java. There's also an architectural difference in that Hill applications run in the browser as client-side applications, whereas Flow apps are server-driven, where the UI runs on the server and the browser acts more as a kind of a rendering engine for that UI. Both frameworks include all the components you need, actually the same exact set, set of components. Uh, you get a full stack project with both, so you build kind of everything in one project and both give you end-to-end -end type safety. Then how is using Hilla different from just using plain React? We get this question a lot, like why would why would we use this instead of just using React? The main big difference here is that Hilla is a full stack framework. So with Hilla and React, you have the same front end uh, development model, but Hilla goes way, way beyond that. So you get a Spring Boot backend uh, configured for you. You get all those UI components. You get a project that kind of combines them into one you get the build tooling that makes sure that they all work together. And then you get this full stack type safety, which allows you to refactor your code and explore APIs a whole lot more efficiently than you would with, say, an untyped REST endpoint. All right, so I'm going to hand over to Anton, and he's going to talk about a couple of the kind of latest uh, features that we've just recently added uh, in the latest version of, of Hilla. And welcome, Anton. Yes. So uh, in the Hilla 1.3 feature release, the main uh, new thing is React support. So uh, the, the possibility to build frontends not only with Lit, but also using React. And uh, the main component uh, behind the React support is uh, uh, actually bringing uh, React support for wadding components. Uh, so a package, it's called uh, Hila React Components. 
what it does the, is that it wraps all all the Vardin components uh, with a, a React wrapper that allows to use it conveniently in the React context. As you can see in this example, uh, the text field and the button are used inside the functional component uh, React uh, view. And in the ID, you will see later in the webinar, it gives uh, the developer experience, which, which is uh, essentially the same as you would use native React components. Um, that's, uh, that's basically it. Uh, technically, uh, how it's uh, shipped is that we have the new Maven artifact. Um, it's uh, Hila-React. And uh, this is kind of the main top-level dependency. Uh, that you would use instead of the regular artifact name, just Hila. And the difference would be that uh, instead of uh, uh, web components, you would have the React wrappers installed uh, automatically if you if you use the depend on this artifact. Um, yeah, then uh, the Hila CLI is the new tool. Previously, we had uh, Vardin CLI that supported Hila. But now it is a, a separate project and a separate utility. So the command line looks a bit shorter. What it does is that allows you to start a new project uh, using Hila. And there is also an option to start the React project as well. But by default, if you don't give the React option, it, it will create still the lib-based projects. Um, so here's the command line. You can see it on the screen is fairly short. That's how you start a new project using Hila. Yes. Let's go to the next slide. Yes, and regarding documentation, uh, uh, previously we had only lit examples, but now with 1.3 release, the documentation website received a significant update. It's kind of split onto two sections, uh, lit and React, depending on which technology you use for building the front end. Uh, so the, the React section of, is, of course, very new, so it is. Uh, uh, unfortunately, still missing a few articles uh, from the lit one. Uh, if you compare them side by side, uh, but hopefully there's enough for you to get started. Um, yeah. Now it is, I think, over to back to you, Marcus. That was everything yes. about the one point three release. Well, I'm gonna keep you on here, and we're gonna pair program just some stuff and see how all of this works in in practice. Because I, I mean. Slides are great and all, but I think when we're talking about a programming tool, like the best way of actually learning how it works is by looking at code. So let's jump into some code there. Yes. OK. And so here I have the Hila CLI that Anton just showed you. And we're going to use this React parameter here to create a React project with Hila. I'm using NPX here. So in order to run this, you need to have Node installed on your computer. If you want to create a project uh, without having Node installed on your computer, you can go to the website and use one of the download links. But we're going to use the CLI here. And when we run this, it's going to create a new uh, application for us. So if we CD into this uh, Hilla React application, you will see that we have a Maven project here. I'm going to use. IntelliJ idea to open this project, but you could use essentially any any ID that you're familiar with and, and kind of like using. And what you get then is a Maven project. So you have a POM file here. You'll see that it is a Spring Boot project. Right now, this is using Spring Boot version 2.78, so latest two series. And the next version of Hilla coming out uh, in March will support uh, Spring Boot 3, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, and we'll we'll get to that a little bit later. But anyway, so we're, we're working with Spring Boot 2 here. And if we look at the project structure here, you'll see that we have this source main Java normal uh, Maven project structure here, where we have a Spring Boot application. And then we have this separate front end folder, which is the entire front end of our application. Now we can start the application like any other Spring Boot application just by running the application class here. 
or we could go into the into the command line and use Maven to to run it. So you could also just use the Maven wrapper uh, to run that. I'm just going to use the ID here to start the application. Yeah. And what happens I'm, when we go ahead? Yeah, just just one comment that I believe starting with Spring Boot three, it's uh, preferred to run the main application class because this makes debugging easier. Sadly, yeah. the the Maven wrapper does not uh, uh, allow for the no fork mode anymore in Spring Boot. Yeah, exactly. Just... I mean, that's that's a good point because like if you're if you were to start this in debug mode, that that'll make it a little bit more difficult if you're not running the same process. Yep. So what's happening here behind the scenes is that just open up. It opened up on my second window here, so I'm gonna. Pull that up into my main screen. There we go. So what happens when you run that application the first time is if we look at what's going on here, essentially it started out by downloading all the Maven dependencies that it needed. Then it downloaded all the front end dependencies it needed through Node. Now I had already uh, used this version of Hello before, so it took, didn't take all that long for me. And then it started Vite for running the front-end compilation and the front-end dev server. So by just running this one Spring Boot application, we were able to start the entire kind of application, both front-end and back-end, which is, I think, pretty pretty kind of handy. I didn't have to spend a whole lot of time configuring how Vite should be uh, handling React or anything else. So, so that's, that's very convenient to me. You'll also notice that if we go into a component like this and we add code to it, so let's say add a flow world tag here, it'll actually show up here immediately. So there's that really nice auto uh, reload or live reload functionality built into this, right? Um, all right, so we've taken a look at how we create a project, how we can uh, how the structure looks like and, and running the project. So I think, Anton, now's a good time for us to be looking at some of the components. What are some of your favorite components to be looking at? Hmm. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, how about we, well, we we'll probably want to create some sort of backend for our application just so we can see how that like front end backend communication works. So maybe we start by creating a endpoint for us in the backend and then we can access that endpoint from from the front end. Maybe that's a good idea. Sure. All right, very good. So again, we have the source main Java folder here where all the backend code lives. And right now we have this hello React endpoint here and it says uh, it has this uh, one method here, say hello, which takes in a string and then it either greets a stranger or a name. And if we type in my name here, say hello, it'll show up here. And the way we are calling that from our code is here. So we're essentially doing an await on the hello react endpoint class with say hello. So what, what's cool here again is that we are not calling a URL endpoint. We are calling a method, which makes this a whole lot easier for us as developers to, to, to look at. Now, we can create a new class here and create our own endpoint just to kind of see what the process looks like. So because it's very early in the morning, I don't have a whole lot of ideas. I think we're going to stick to the classic to-do example and, and be working with that today. So we'll create a to-do endpoint here. And a to-do endpoint is just a class that has a endpoint annotation, which tells Hilla that this should, uh, or all the public methods here should be exposed to the client. And then we need this anonymous allowed annotation here. What does that do, uh, Anton? Well, that allows uh, for for this endpoint to be called without uh, authentication, because by default, I think we have authentication checks enabled on the backend. So Do you want to talk a little bit about like how Hello same. works with authentication while I type out all these? Sure. So 
Um, basically, what Hila does behind the scenes when endpoints are called is that we check uh, with the uh, through the servlet APIs for the presence of the uh, 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 what's that called the user. Um, uh, I I forgot the name. <laughs> That was something starting with the P. Now uh, for for the we check for the user presence and uh, the principle. there are also principle uh, exactly yeah yes thanks for the chat <laughs> principle um, yeah and then uh, if the principle is present uh, you can additionally enable role based checks uh, that will be verified using is user enroll from the servlet APIs. Of course, the, the main um, way of uh, enabling security uh, is uh, through using Spring security. And this is what the authentication starter would uh, give you. So if you type, uh, if you give the dash dash auth option for the command line, it, it would create you a slightly different, more complex project that comes with the uh, authentication enabled using uh, the uh, in-memory uh, database in Spring Security and with all the configuration and with the login form uh, yeah. and uh, things like that. So, okay. yes, on the endpoint level, uh, yes, as I already mentioned, uh, in order to make public anonymously called endpoints without authentication checks, you would have to use anonymous allowed because the default is secure. And yes, there is also roles allowed annotation uh, particularly but it's it, it's basically like what you're what you're saying is that like the security and everything is handled still by spring security so it's it's nice in the way that you're you're still working with tools that you you're familiar with from the before yeah nice yeah and um, yeah the configuration is fairly straight straightforward there if you have the Authentication handled in Spring Security, then Hila would, would be using that as well. All right, so I, I got a little carried away here and I added uh, H2 and, and Spring Data JPA dependencies for us. So we have a backend here, and then I'm going to actually persist these to a database so we have like a more realistic application. So I'm creating a uh, Spring Data repository here, and I I'm now in my to-do endpoint, and I'm actually ready to to start creating this. So let's take in our database repository here. This will uh, create a field for it, and then we can essentially start creating out our methods here. So you're saying every public method is kind of available to the client. Does that mean that private methods are not? Yes, exactly. OK, so that's good. So if you have like a utility method, that's not going to accidentally get published to the to the client for, for no reason. Yeah. So let's. Uh... And by the way, oh. all the beams that you mentioned in the public methods, like the to do here, but also exactly that was handled. Yeah. that's going to be one of the cooler things. So here I'm, I'm just going to uh, de delegate all of these things to the repository, really. And and I know probably s at least Simon on the call will probably be pointing out that I shouldn't be returning find all from the repo, repo here because, I mean, I might be returning a gazillion entities, but let's, <laughs> let's keep things simple here in our code. So what I'm just doing is I'm returning all the to-dos we have in one method, and then we'll have a public void uh, method for, or actually public to-do method for uh, saving one, or let's call this add instead, and this will take in a string for the task like this, and then that will just return what we get back from calling the repository dot save with a new to do with that task like that. That look. Let me know, Anton, if I'm I'm doing things that are very weird. So I, I think that should. Like we have one method of getting all of them, and then we have one for adding. We'll we'll see if we need one for updating them, but I think this should uh, get us started. 
So yeah. now if we build a project, some magic should happen, right? Yes, now um, uh, the, the generator should pick those changes up and actually meet the front end helpers. So I'm just gonna reuse this view here because I don't feel like typing. All right, so we'll we'll work within this hello world view here. I'm gonna have a div if I can type. This is one thing that always trips me off with React, especially coming from Lit, is that you can only return one element, or then you have to return that empty fragment, which is kind of weird. So let's see. Is this working? No. So I didn't probably restart this after I added all those new dependencies, which is why it's not happy with me. So let's see that everything is up and running. Looks like we might be able to get some live debugging going on here too. Are you seeing any, yeah. any clear errors here? No. All right. Everything's good so far. Except it's not running. I mean, that's a slight problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. No. What restarting it help maybe? Yeah. It does. All right. So we, I'm going to clear out everything that we have here just so we don't uh, have anything extra here. And if we are sticking to our kind of to-do application example here, what we need is a state to kind of contain all those to-dos, right? So we'll yeah. have a array of to-dos and then a set to-dos that are like this and then we'll use the use state hook from react and start out with an empty array now what we can do here is because we're using typescript and and we have those auto generated types we can say that this is of uh type to do array like this and we can actually import this wow which, means that we didn't actually have to go and write this ourselves. There is a generated to-do type that is matching our uh, matching our backend Java class, which is, I think, super, super helpful. Yeah. One All right. tiny little thing that I would also do right away is, is use the read-only array of to-dos. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's going to be read-only because of how we're uh, working here. Yeah. So. I tend to stick to just plain arrays here, but certainly if you want to be more kind of academic, you are, or, or kind of be more cautious, I think would be the right yeah. word there. Yeah, yeah. All right, well. Oh, by the way, there's one question in the, uh, in the questions panel regarding yeah. if we are able to use third-party React libraries. So yeah. um, uh, let's actually show it just real quick in, the, in your ID. So we have, the regular package JSON file that was uh, generated by the CLI. And uh, it comes with a whole bunch of stuff. And especially we take care of uh, updating the our own heel and body and stuff there. That would be uh, that uh, um, as going, are going to be going to be aligned with the version specified in the Maven uh, dependency. Yeah. But uh, otherwise, it's at your disposal. So you're free yeah. to add any third-party libraries you want there as regular NPM dependencies or dev dependencies as you can use them. Yeah. And I mean, we as could probably can. show already that we're, uh, for instance, using, let's see here. Yeah, we're already using some libraries like React Router here. Yeah. So yeah, you can already see some of the View, views uh, being specified here and their routes. I think there's, I don't know what all of this extra code here is. It's probably some oh. metadata for, for the views. But anyway, the gist of it is that we're using yeah. the just normal React router here. Uh, with React and Hilla, we have really tried to like not reinvent too many wheels. We want to help people work with the tools that they are familiar with and, and kind of uh, productive with already instead of introducing a whole lot of new new functionality. And the same will go with like uh, form and validation support so that that for that we're also building on kind of existing tools instead of building our own binder the same way that we did for lit, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, well, fortunately with React, uh, the ecosystem is much more kind of yeah. uh, mature and, and there are great libraries there that we can all benefit from using. Exactly. So to get back to our example here, now that we have the kind of place to place our state, we need to actually call the server somehow. And in a functional React component like this, uh, we need to define all the side effects. So anything that has a side effect needs to be using this use effect hook. And here we can then go and uh, use our new endpoint. And you can see that just like using my ID autocomplete, I can already kind of see what are the endpoints that are available to me. And I can see what are the different methods that those expose to me. So again, here's the difference between using Hilla and using something like a REST endpoint where we would be looking at uh, documentation probably in our browser to understand where are the uh, APIs available to us, whereas here we can just uh, explore them through our ID. This is always an asynchronous call, so we could either use the then a promise API, do something with it, or we could use the async away. I'm going to use the then API here because it's a little bit uh, shorter here. And this is not going to be happy with me because if you look at the uh, complaint here, it's saying that the type of uh, to do or undefined is not compatible with what we had here where we're only dealing with to do's. And that is something that we need to go in and either change here in our backend code or then we need to deal with it here in the front end. And I, I prefer to do this in the back end. And maybe, Anton, you can talk a little bit about what, what's happening here. Why, why is it complaining about these undefined values? Oh, yeah. Values? Yeah, the, I think it's the $1 billion mistake manifests is that uh, all the Java types are nullable by default. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have to explicitly declare if something is not null. And the easiest way to do it by, uh, at the moment is to use the non-null API annotation yeah. from Spring Framework that makes the entire package work as if uh, everything is uh, certainly not a null. Yeah, and what I really like here too is that like IntelliJ is, is super smart about it. So if I were to try to uh, return null here, it's going to it's going to let me know that, hey, I'm, I'm in a non-null API package and I'm trying to return null. So that's probably not what it, I want to do. So it, it yeah. sort of enforces but it. If you somehow manage to return null, there's going to be another layer of... Then a, there's going to be a... Yeah. yeah. This is something where I think it'll be interesting to explore like Kotlin in the future because Kotlin and TypeScript's definition of what should be nullable are much more closer related than Java's and TypeScript's. But... This is just something to keep in mind that because Java and TypeScript don't have a shared understanding of what should be nullable, we want to be explicit about it, or rather you should be explicit about it. Either you want to handle it yourself or or then uh, you can just use the non-null API like we did here. All right, so uh, let me just build the project and hopefully that should get picked up here in a second. All right, so the... Browser already picked it up, and now we can see the squiggly line went away as well. Oh, magic. So so <laughs> that worked. And I mean, if we look at this now, uh, or not that, but if we look at the to-do endpoint, well, I guess this is generated code, but we can see that it's now not having that or undefined type yeah. there. All right, so uh, what we need then is First of all, just list the to-dos that we have. And for that, we can take the to-do state that we have. We can map over them to get one to-do at a time. And then we can return some kind of snippet of, uh, of uh, HTML. So let's just turn this into an unordered list for the sake of simplicity like this. And then we'll return a list item for each of these. And when we go to the to-do here, you can see that we, we have autocomplete here because we know what a to-do is. We have the stuff here. So we can just say that we want to show the task for this for now. Uh, when we're mapping over things in React Land, it does want to have a key. So we can pass in the ID of the to-do here just so we have a key to map over. Now, of course, we don't have any to-do, so it's not 
like super helpful right now. So we probably need to have a another form here where we can add those. So let's create a div and use some of the kind of built-in utility CSS that we have while we're at it. So I'm going to create a flexbox with a small gap between components. And we're going to use the text field component. And we're going to use the button component to add new things. Now, this is touching the, the browser window here. And that's something that I really don't like. So I'm going to add a little padding medium here on the main view. So we have, have a nicer looking view. Also, the button, we can use the theme attribute here to say that this should be a primary button to make it appear a little bit. So you can see that we've also built in a lot of these cool kind of theming and layouting uh, helpers just to make you, again, more productive. OK, so we have those. Uh, we could maybe have a placeholder here of ask so people know what to put in there like that. And that'll show up there. So you can see that they're kind of fa fairly fully featured, these, these components. Now, in React Land, we want to kind of think, uh, functionally think in a reactive way when we're dealing with things. So if we want to capture the value out of this text field, we want to have a state for that value that we can both pass into that uh, input and then read out from it. So I'm going to create another state here for just the input and set input like this. And that's going to be, a, again, a use state hook with an empty start state. And because this is a string, hard-coded string, the type information is automatically deduced from there. Yeah, so, so it's kind of the bound input fields pattern. It is the bound input fields pattern. And in the next, I think, couple of versions of Hilla will have a uh, like we were talking earlier about a slightly more convenient way of building forms as well. So if you have uh, validation rules and stuff that you can reuse those that you've defined on the Java side, right? Yeah. All right. So, so we take the value and we bind it here. So we take the input value and bind it here. The idea here is that what's it? What's visible in the browser should always this the t this template should always be kind of a uh, function of the state. So if the initial state was SDF, that's what should be visible here. And to close the loop, what we need to do then is also uh, somehow react to when that value changes. So we will say on change, and then we get an event from here. And what we'll do is set the input to the event target value. So the event target being the text field and the value being the value in the text field. And that way, we have a uh, kind of a loop where we get the state as a starting value, and then we pass it back into the state when we're done. And for this to actually work, we need to do one last thing, which is to uh, which is to actually hook up the button to call the server. So we'll do an on click event, and let's just call this function add. We'll. Uh, this is really weird in IntelliJ. Like the first time you go to autocomplete, it doesn't suggest add function, but the next time you do it, it does. So that's a weird IntelliJ feature <laughs> or bug or whatever you want to call it. Hmm. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to turn this into an async function, meaning that I have a slightly more convenient way of dealing with these asynchronous calls to the to the backend. Because what we want to do is we want to take the to-do endpoint, we want to call add, and we want to pass the input value to there. And what we want to get back from here is the, if we look at what add does, it saves a new to-do and then it returns that saved to-do to us. So we want to get the So this is to get the ID back. Well, mm -hmm. in, in this case, I'm, I'm actually returning the, the actual to-do back, not yeah. the ID. Because what I want to do is I want to get the saved value, and I want to add that to our to-dos array here on the client side. So I'm going to say to-do. Yeah, and makes sense. I'm going to take all the previous to-dos that we have, and then I'm going to add the saved to-do here. 
And this is not going to work because I purposefully <laughs> made a small mistake here because when we're in an async function, if we're doing an async call to the server, we want to await that. So essentially, this is telling uh, TypeScript to await the value from that to return. Then it will kind of unwrap that promise. And what we get here now is if you look at the type information, is that to do. This whole dance here, if you're unfamiliar with TypeScript, is that we create a new array. We destructure the previous to do value. So we essentially take all the values from the previous array, and then we add this new, newly created thing to it. The reason we're doing this and kind of hinting towards what you were saying earlier, Anton, there with the read only array, is that the state here is essentially immutable. So React doesn't look at the contents of an array. It's looking at the actual reference to the array. So if we yeah. just put more values into an existing array, it's not going to pick those up. Yeah. All right. So, so using the DOM they have arrays in the first place, just going to give you a hint if you try to do that. Yeah, <laughs> like exactly. And, and that might be very helpful. All right. So what do you think, Anton? If I type in something here, is this going to work? Uh, yeah, it should. All right. Um, yeah, it kind of worked. Whoa. We let's refresh and we can verify that that actually does come from back from the database. And there was kind of a annoying thing here that when we added something, it didn't clear out the field here. So the way yeah. we could deal with that is we could set the input state to empty again. And as you remember, we bound that to the text field. So uh, if we now add this, it will just clear out that field immediately. And you might have seen kind of an interesting feature there is that when I saved this, it didn't actually reload the entire browser window. It hot module replaced the changes here. So my input field value didn't even change when we made that update to the code. So Amazing. that's pretty. Uh, pretty interesting. It, it does lead to some weird situations at, at times as well. So it's good to keep in mind that that is, uh, that yeah. is what happening. Good. Um, anything else you think we should be looking at? Do you have any questions uh, there in the, in the questions that are kind of relevant to code that we should be going through? There's one other thing I, I have in mind, but let's see if we have any questions before we get there. Um, well, um, I'm Let's just uh, do this real quick. So uh, let's open the inspect in the browser and uh, see what kind of the trees is, is there. All right. Good so call. That, that was a question like, can we still use pod in button? So yes. I'm just gonna, I was just going to demonstrate that the button that we have here is the same exact pod in button you know and love. So <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah, it's here. Yeah, the, it's there with all the APIs uh, with, yeah. with React uh, just uh, just available in React. But yeah, exactly. It, and, and this is something that I think is just such a nice side benefit from us building the components set in web components is that we are able to reuse the same components across different frameworks. So the wrappers that you mentioned, the React wrappers, aren't really, they, they're not changing the component implementations. They're just giving React some additional information so it can use them more efficiently in the JSX. Yeah. Good. A um, couple of things I wanted to show here, too, is just in the little dev mode widget here, there are some feature flags that you might uh, want to look into. So one thing being the push support in Hilla, I think that's a pretty cool one. And the multi-module engine, uh, Anthony, you want to tell a little bit about that while I show a quick demo of yeah. the push support? Yeah, so the multi-module engine is uh, really helpful for a big project. So what, what, what it allows is it, it actually allows you to restructure the application and split it uh, onto a few Maven uh, sub-modules, um, having endpoints in one module, for example, and another bunch of endpoints in another module, and so on. So uh, with the regular uh, flag disabled, we uh, use uh, a source-based uh, parser for Java in order to find an, an endpoints and generate them. So that's a limitation for, for the bigger projects, um, uh, of course. But when you enable the flag, this just magically replaces it with a you know, JVM bytecode based 
um, parser that uh, just does not really care about where the where where the class is actually where the source for the class is actually hosted. So just something helpful for beer projects for the organizing the code. And another side benefit of using a JVM bytecode browser is uh, is that uh, um, it uh, automatically supports all the JVM based languages, including Kotlin. There was a question about Kotlin support in in, in the panel, so let me uh, also tell about the state there. Yep. So when you enable multi-module engine, Kotlin starts to work, uh, but uh, there is, of course, this is this does is this is not exactly equal to like full feature of Kotlin support. So that's why we do not explicitly list it in the features for 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 this. But yeah. what what is currently missing is that some the nullability for the for the Kotlin specific nullability. I mean, the uh, question mark syntax is not supported in all the cases. So sometimes you would still have to resort to using non-null. Uh, uh, API or uh, non-null uh, annotations. And then also, I think Gradle is something essential when you use Kotlin, and we do not yet have a Gradle plugin for Hila. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the state of it. It, it is technically working, but there's, there, there are things to improve. Yeah. And, and of course, we are, gonna, we are going to stabilize uh, uh, does a multi-module engine and make it the new default. This is not yet coming in this, in in the two point just yet, but uh, hopefully with the next feature release. Yep. Two point one maybe. Nice. All right. Um. So what I did while you were explaining the multi-module engine and Kotlin was I created a new method in our endpoint that returns a flux instead of just a static list of strings. So a flux is essentially a data type that can like keep returning values over and over again. So I just returned a couple of strings here with a delay of two seconds between each of these to-dos. And we're just reusing the same to-do view that we have here. And instead of calling find all here, what I did was I called the new method that returns a flux and said on next to-do. So whenever a new to-do gets pushed to us from the server, we update the, the state and what that looks like in the client is that we get these new items just appearing in our our view every couple seconds, which I think is really cool. So that this is something that you can use as a building block when you're doing like full stack reactive applications. Maybe you're monitoring something happening in the real world, a package moving, uh, I don't know, a system crashing, stocks going up and down, whatever it might be. This is super handy in that you can, if you have a reactive data source somewhere in your system, you can just pipe that data all the way to your to your UI in one go. All right. Um, in the interest of time, let's let you, Anton, talk about what's coming up in Hilla 2, and then we'll save the rest of the time for, for Q&A. All right. So uh, the main... Uh, feature coming in the 2.0. That's why we have the major version change in the first place is the support for Spring Boot 3 and uh, and also upgrading to Jakarta E10. So that, uh, that requires API changes, of course, for your applications. And uh, uh, we took uh, here uh, also our part in updating the uh, things on our behalf. Uh, of course, the new feature release is going to be uh, requiring Java 17, as the Spring Boot 3 does in the first place. Um, that's just so that we have the uh, the stack aligned. And uh, there's one smaller feature is that it includes uh, AOT compiler hints that allows to use native compilation, which can drastically speed up and uh, starting a project uh, or starting an application in the cloud or something like that. Um, uh, other than that, another thing related with the 2.0, um, it's not technically a part of the Hilo project itself, but it's an add-on for it uh, is the SSO kit. We, we have it currently for Vlad and Flow. And uh, at the moment we are working on the SSO kit for Hilo. 
What it does is that it allows to add single sign-on sign -on capabilities to your application using third-party authentication providers. Uh, it is based on OpenID Connect uh, and of course uses Spring Security, uh, provides all the necessary configuration for you there. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, it supports Keycloak, Okta, and Azure Active Directory. And uh, as I mentioned, it's not a part of the Hilo project, but it's a, its own commercial feature and that requires login subscription uh, for using. Um, yeah. Same release date, uh, we have the release cycle combined, so it's uh, scheduled for 1st of March, 2023, yes. Very good. And uh, I think at this point, we're gonna run one last poll if we manage to get this working technically. So let's see if we get the last poll running here. So based on what you just saw, <laughs> what are your kind of initial reactions? Just go ahead and answer the answer the poll question there and we'll collect those as, as we go through the Q&A. So we'll keep that up and running uh, throughout this and and uh, and we will go to Q&A. All right, so let's take a look at the questions that we have here. All right, so um, seems like we have a good number of questions here. So, all right. We're apparently we're missing the greatest technology for front end Svelte kit. So put that on your <laughs> on your to do list on to explain uh, Adrian asks if uh, Vaadin eat uh, female reindeers. Vaadin eat cloudberries hilla for breakfast. Of course they do, and also for <laughs> lunch and dinner. Yeah, that might be. Um, uh, is it possible to have the same in the same project lit pages and React pages? with the same security Spring Boot and backend endpoints? Well, at the moment, this is uh, kind of hard to establish because the routers on the front end are different. Uh, with lit, we use Vaadin router, and with React, we, we use React router. So because yeah. of th th there's going to be conflicts behind yeah. if you would just try to yeah. combine them. I, mean, I think you could like basically get it working if you just had like a React component that just included that one lit component as its child, it probably would work just fine. Yeah, of course. Yeah, there's one option is that you can wrap existing lit views as React components and just use them in React world or that way. Yeah. Good. Um, all right. So how frequently will Spring Boot be updated in the Palm? So uh, he's thinking about security updates especially. Yeah, I think this is essentially up to the users because uh, we depend on the starter dependency in the POM XML, and we have the version number there for you to update. Yeah, so I think kind of the TLDR is that we, we try to keep it up to date on our end, but once you generate the project, then you will have to kind of take care of updating it going forward, because we yes. don't, like Vaadin version updates will not go in and change your POM file for you. Uh, are we able to use React third-party libraries? We asked that. And we yes. looked at the Kotlin support. Yes. Uh, all right. So then they had a question about, and like, is it possible to reuse existing REST endpoints with Hilla? So if you already have some REST endpoints and you want to use Hilla? Certainly using third party data frameworks for React. Uh, I believe yeah. there's a bunch of uh, utilities that allows to call a REST endpoint. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I, I think we, we, we do not worth... have like support, like an explicit tooling for for our REST endpoints ourselves. No, but what's kind of worth noting is that we have a standard Spring Boot backend and a standard React front end, so it, nothing changes in that sense. So you can yeah. still call those endpoints from React as you have before, and then you could yeah. create new new endpoints then for if you want to call them through through methods like we did here. Yeah, but of course, if you do manual REST endpoint calls, then you would have to take care of the data uh, type safety. All right, then we have a question about uh, endpoints and and like what's great about using REST APIs is that they're breeze. What about retries and query caches and stuff like uh, they have in React Query? Well, 
what's actually good, and I, I tried this out just a few weeks ago, is that the endpoints work just straight out of the box with React Query as well, and it even they even return or kind of retain all the type information. So you, if you want to use React Query with TypeScript uh, or, or the TypeScript endpoints, you can do that and kind of get the benefits of both. But we didn't want to kind of force React Query or any other kind of abstraction library on top of that. So they're kind of easy enough to use as they are, or you can then use them together with another, either like React Query or whatever state management library or whatever else you might want to use. So we didn't want to be that prescriptive in, in how you have to build your application. Yeah. Uh, then there was a question about being able to add hill of use to an existing VOD in flow application. Anton, I think that's for you. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> this is possible, but uh, at the moment uh, it is only supported with the lead uh, based projects. So um, this is something called a hybrid application. And uh, you can pretty much with the VOD in flow out of the box start uh, enable uh, client side bootstrap that was and uh, then you would have front end generated there, and then you can add uh, 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 the the button router there, yeah, uh, and start uh, creating lead based views. It doesn't yeah. really require much on top of that. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think there is a a ticket somewhere about adding support for React and views in a Flow application. We just haven't gotten to that. Yeah. All right, um, let's continue on our questions. <laughs> we have many coming in, so uh, we'll, we'll be here for a while. Let's see. Uh, how is the communication between the browser and the server? Is Hilla using REST calls or something like gRPC? Are you able to give some in insights into that? Yeah, it's something like REST in practice. I think it's always a post request uh, with the JSON. So looking very, very REST-like uh, in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And with a uh, with with a push support though, that's uh, uh, web sockets uh, using Atmosphere at the moment. Yeah. Good. All right. Um, all right. Let's see. Next one. Com can you tell something about the combined validation between front end and back end? Yeah, so that's, uh, again, something that uh, needs to be improved in the React uh, feature. But with, with Lit, what we have is that we have the uh, form binder that supports uh, validations that you define in Java. So pretty much you declare uh, 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 using the bean validations. bean validation annotations. Yes, you declare validations uh, on the backend. And then the front end binder will just uh, pick up those uh, with the same data and do additional validation on the client side. So yeah. kind of uh, benefit uh, having both uh, uh, and uh, for the sake of quicker uh, response for the to the users, but also being safe. Yeah, I think one thing that's like super handy to me at least is that it actually revalidates those constraints when you save that back to the server. So just like it, it provides those validations in the UI as a convenience to the user, but it doesn't trust the client to, like, as it shouldn't, and it it revalidates those on on the way back. Yeah. Um, all right. So then we have one question about code splitting and SSR. Have you done anything in terms of like making code splitting or SSR easier? Well, sadly, no, uh, because uh, that's. Uh... Um, that's slightly outside of our main focus here at Vaden. So we, we, we basically have, uh, we are focusing on the use case of creating business apps more than websites. And for those, the SSR is not that much relevant because uh, for the most of the time, the entire content is uh, hidden from the public uh, behind the login form or something like that. So uh, the SSR is somewhere on our feature radar, but it's, it doesn't have a high priority yeah. because of that. And when it comes to code splitting, there's, I mean, that works the same way as in pretty much any React application. Yeah. So. Yeah, I believe that's like 
currently the front end build is handled by Git, and if you use async imports, then it will take a it, it can split your bundle. Yeah. Uh, then we have two very related questions. So the first one being, how is everything bundled for production deployment? Is everything bundled in one Spring Boot jar or in a different way? And the second one is, how do I change the backend URL of generated Hilla endpoints, assuming I want to deploy the backend part of the application on a different server? So you yeah, want to so talk I, about production deployments a little bit? Sure. So everything is bundled uh, under a single Spring Boot jar. Uh, but of course, that doesn't stop you uh, uh, from creating more sophisticated deployment setups, like having the, all the static context extracted from the jar and hosted elsewhere on the CDN or somewhere. Um, that's that's how it is. And customizing the backend URL is possible. We have a, a file generated. It's called connectclient.ts, uh, where uh, you can tweak the options of uh, where the actual requests are going. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, right now we're t targeting simplicity, so just single jar deployment, but we certainly will keep our eyes and ears open also for what we hear from from you, the users, and, and kind of see how people would like to improve that in, or kind of change that in the future. So, all right. Um, what... Simon is asking, "What's the state of Hilla? Uh, what's the state of Hilla two? Is uh, cross-site request forgery working now?" So that he had opened an issue. Yeah. Was... Yeah, I believe this issue is still open. Uh, we haven't looked into that yet, uh, sadly. But uh, we are surely going to fix this during the beta period, so so that everything works. Yeah, and I think Ricardo. Uh, commented that Hilla 2 will support Spring Authorization Server 1.0. So I think that's along with Spring Boot 3 support. That should be OK. Awesome. Uh, Levi asked, are there plans on supporting Next.js with React in the future? And that, that would be a no. So Next.js is, is kind of a, like Hilla would be an alternative to doing that. So both are kind of full stack. React frameworks, but meant for slightly different types of applications. Whereas I think Next.js is more geared towards building like dynamic websites, kind of outward facing uh, things. Hilla is really geared more towards building like application applications. So they're slightly different kind of core use cases for them. And, but they are kind of not, at least as far as I know, Anton, like we don't have any plans on trying to yeah. merge the two. Yeah, no plans. I think the hill of four angular, like the next question from Simon, is, is yeah. a lot higher <laughs> in the priority list. Yeah, so that that is certainly something we are going to be looking into. Uh, with the kind of approach we had with Hilla, is we wanted to make sure that it kind of validate the idea first with a narrow stack, and then we might go and broaden that by like first of all, we added support for React. We probably will look into adding support for Angular. I know there have been a lot of questions also about like on the backend side of things, like maybe Quark is support at some point. Like yeah. we'll we'll look into all of these, but we want to kind of move at a deliberate pace and, and one kind step of at a time. Please. One step at a time. <laughs> uh, all right, then can Hilla be useful in big scale projects? I, I think so. Like the fact that you have this kind of type safety net tying things together will help more people work together. <laughs> in a more orderly fashion. So if if Anton changes code that like I happen to depend on, he would immediately know that's happening. I think it also is better suited for uh, long time frame projects where you might need to maintain an application for a long period of time, again, because you have a little bit more of that type safety net helping you with refactoring and, and restructuring the code over, over time. Uh, all right, so then we had one question about PWA. Hilla supports the PWA annotation similar to bot inflow, which will then generate a manifest file with an icon you specify, and it will generate a service worker that yeah. will cache all the assets for you. So that's something that's built in. Yeah. And uh, unlike from Flow, you can also actually put the views offline. Yeah. That's, a, that's are, a really good point. So, yeah, you can. If if you, yeah, if you want to uh, support offline views in your application, this is something that you can do as well. 
Uh, Ralph is interested about speed. I think Hilla is great for speed. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, it, it doesn't really contain any server side state unless you add some yourself. So in terms of like resources used per user, it's quite lightweight, similar to, I guess, hosting a REST endpoint or what would you say, Anton? Yeah. Yeah. Well, not too much to comment on on there on that regard. But the yeah. the main speed benefits that you would have with uh, Hila is of course the speed of development and making changes yeah. to your project. Yeah, but I, I'm what I'm trying to get at is that you, there's not really a huge cost of that development time benefit in in productivity yeah. because like <clears> the the runtime overhead of yeah. Hilla compared to using a REST endpoint is very negligible. Yeah, I guess uh, under the hood, it's, it's just small. using, yeah. For the, exactly. for the most part, the features are just build time. Exactly, <laughs> good. We already covered Gradle, so we'll skip that. Uh, all right, currently using Flow, how deep is the learning curve for Hilla? And for that, I mean, it is a different, framework in the sense that you're building the UI in TypeScript with HTML and, and CSS. So uh, you're still, you, you have the same set of components. And so that might help you a little bit, but the way of building applications, as you probably saw in the in the demo, is, is quite different. So I think Hilla is a good kind of first framework to venture into the front end world if you are a Java developer, because you kind of get the type safe guardrails extending all the way from the back end to the front end and like everything is in TypeScript in the front end, but it certainly will be kind of a learning process for you if you're not familiar with front end development from before. Yeah. However, if if what you saw in the <clears throat> in the webinar live coding session didn't scare you right away, then you could probably just jump in. Yeah. Uh, then a question from Sylvan uh, do you plan to maintain both Hilla and Lit, uh, or Hilla with Lit and React? And the answer there is yes. Yes, yes. The plan yeah. is uh, well. Right now, React support is not, uh, not yet at, at, on the same kind of level feature-wise with Lit, but the plan is to keep them equally supported in future. Yeah. Good. And uh, is there a way to migrate existing bot and uh, flow projects to Hilla? Uh, Asks Nick. Um, well, the, that's for that's something, something like you would migrate your VOD and Flow projects to. Like it's an alternative way of building applications that may be kind of more appropriate for certain uh, teams with certain skill sets or uh, developers with certain yeah. preferences. So there is like no built in reason why you would have to kind of migrate from. Uh, VOD and flow to Hilla. That said, we did talk about the possibility of doing hybrid applications where you have some Hilla views embedded in your VOD and flow application, if that is something that you want to do. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, any plans for Vue.js? I, I think that <laughs> kind of goes into the same bucket of uh, Angular, but not as high priority. So we've heard a lot of uh, questions about Angular, just I, I think because, like, because of historical reasons, the Angular development model sort of closely looked like uh, Java development with kind of uh, dependency injection and all kinds of functionalities there. So there's a lot of Angular usage in the Java world, and I think that makes it a kind of a natural thing for us to look at. Um, Somebody asked about uh, Google authentication support in the works. Uh, I can answer that probably. I'm writing a blog post as we speak, so I'll have something on that matter out shortly, hopefully. Uh, all right. Is it possible to call the backend from another technology, say Flutter? Um, yes. Uh, well, the. You can you can of course do the JSON like calls directly, but uh, there's no reason of also not to use endpoints as they are because they're not coupled with React or Lit or anything. They 
they just use uh, standard flat uh, fetch requests behind the scenes. So you can pretty much import them in any TypeScript uh, code and call as usual for as long as it works from the browser where, where a fetch is available. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not something we've specifically designed it to work with, but you might be able to uh, do that. All right. Uh, just two more questions uh, remaining here. So let's wrap these up and then we'll get everyone on with their day. All right. So one is, is deployment Kubernetes friendly? And the answer would be yes, in my opinion. Anton, you have any insights into why it wouldn't be? So again, we're deploying essentially a standard Spring Boot application. Yeah, yeah, it is friendly. And I think the by default, we use uh, stateless authentication. So the authentication starter generates a project where uh, that doesn't even use sessions uh, on the server side, so it may, which makes it even more Kubernetes friendly yep. than a regular Spring Boot. All right. And then the last one is, will Hilla be free for longer time? So you want to talk about yeah. sort of the release model there and support lengths? Uh, yeah, uh, I think that the current policy is that we support the uh, version for, was it five years? So, uh, so the essentially a major is uh, supported for one full year after yeah. the next major is yeah. is uh, released. If you are on one of the paid uh, plans, you can get that up to like five years. So if you want to stay on Hilla 1 for like then five years instead of one year, that is something you can kind of get up as a part of the button subscription. But Hilla itself is, is Apache licensed. It's open source. It, so that's something that's going to remain. Yeah, open source and, and free. Yeah, and same goes for like the core of Arden. It's uh, we are an open source based company, and we we will of course keep the core technology stack free. Yeah. All right, we got a lot of questions. This ended up taking longer than I had anticipated, but just a huge thanks to everyone who joined us. Thanks for being engaged with all those questions. It's super nice to just actually see. Uh, the positive reactions we're getting to this and all the questions are just helping us also understand uh, kind of what's important to you and where we should focus. Uh, if you want to continue discussions, you can find us on the one Discord. Uh, you'll find that on the Hilla website, hilla.dev. Uh, thanks for me. And thank you, Anton, for joining us today. It was a pleasure. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.